I need to be honest with both of you, Lee Zimmerman and uh, we've got Nicholas Kolikos here, who played two fantastic roles in this production. I have seen 15 different casts in this show on Broadway. And I'm going to be really honest with you. This is the best show I've ever seen. Seriously. Yes! Score! Oh, God. You know what? We've, to be um, really sort of boast for this cast, we've we've actually heard that before and it's, it's something you don't want to believe, you know, because you think, oh, right, everybody's just sort of shining you on and saying, right, this cast, go for it. You're the best. But I, you know, you hear it more than a couple of times and you think, wow, could it be true? I think we are. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. Nathan Lane is, without any question of a doubt, phenomenal, unstoppable, and the best Bialystok there could be. But Lee Evans has brought something to this role as Bloom that no other Absolutely. actor, performer, comedian has ever done. I, I think what's interesting about that uh, typical combination between Max Bialystok and Leo Bloom is that Max Bialystok is the comedian and Leo Bloom is the straight man. And what you have here is in, in our straight man of Leo Bloom, Lee Evans, who's known for his comedy. So you actually get two comedians, but with the same setup and punchline dynamic. And that is that extra zing that you that I just don't think that that pairing has had before. I think it was more luck than judgment in the end, because of course, originally it was Richard Dreyfus who is ostensibly more of a straight man than Nathan, certainly. And they probably hedged their bets and went for a comedian with Lee uh, to, to balance it all out. Now, of course, you have two comic titans. And it was fascinating that first First rehearsal when Nathan came over, it was the battle of the comic giants, and neither of them were giving an inch. And to be honest, I think Lee won. <laughs> I, I think I think it's a, a really interesting dynamic for this particular production, which um, you know is is just something. Max Bialystok is the engine of this piece, and while we have that in Nathan, there there will be other actors who can do that. But you know, to have that extra quality in Leo Bloom with Lee Evans is just a treat. I spoke to Lee on Saturday night and we'll be hearing from him later in the program and he was telling me that he has to ask him to kind of hold back a bit because Nathan seems to always want to be the star of the show and get the bigger laughs and he's really? well I, I mean I'll ask him the question but, well I think I think that uh, partly that that is um, part of the role of Max Bialystok I mean he really is the 800 pound gorilla in this production anyway that character is the heavyweight um, and then when you bring to a, a talent like Nathan and uh, you know an actor and a, a weighty weighty comedian like Nathan you, you're gonna expect that um, but I think Lee has held his ground beautifully but if you think about the dynamic of the film I mean you can't ever say that Gene Wilder was a straight man Absolutely. I mean they they were again two comic titans going at it head-to-head -head, uh, very different styles and I think that's what you've got here as well I think you've got much closer to the dynamic of the film than you did to, to Matthew and Nathan in New York the reason I say this is the best production is A, the laughter was louder than I've ever heard it. At one point, Nathan falls over the couch twice and he looks as if he could break his neck on both occasions. I mean, he's, he's not just coming in and taking the money and running, but he's actually giving value for money, isn't he? Well, I think, yes, and I think what's finally happened, and um, Susan Stroman, our director, put this very eloquently to the company when we did have our cast change from Richard to Nathan, was that the caliber of this company is such that when we were in rehearsals, we were just ready to go at the pace we're now able to go. And um, you certainly don't want Mel Brooks material, you know, the actors in in this piece spinning their wheels at any point because you always want to be progressing and, and absolutely barreling through this material. And for a while, we weren't able to do that. So now that we are, it, it is firing on more cylinders than we, than we ever could have hoped for because all of the elements, all of the pieces of the engine now are running properly, you know. Just as far as the amount of money that Nathan has been paid, um, I've done a lot of big shows with a lot of big stars who've made whopping great salaries and I have always questioned whether they deserve it and justification for it, etc, etc. But when you look at the figures, Nathan isn't even getting the take from one performance a week and the energy, the stamina, the performance he puts in day in, day out, matinees included, more than deserves what he's getting, really. We're here today for an exclusive hour-long session here at The Producers, and it really is a session because we're going to hear lots of pieces of music from the show. We're at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane for this fantastic production. I can't champion it enough because of the effort that's been put into it. Coming up, we're going to talk to Brad Oscar, who's the current Bialystok on Broadway, and Hunter Foster, who's Bloom. 
Uh, we're here with Lee Zimmerman today, who is Ula. Firstly, were you thrilled to get this role? This is one of the most highly sought after roles ever in the West End. Yeah, I was thrilled. That's a big yeah. Um, I think it's it's on many levels for me. It wasn't just to play Ula um, because I didn't really know what that meant yet. And you don't really know all that that means until you are actually cast and you start really investing and exploring the role. My, my main goal and my excitement at, in the beginning was to work with Susan Stroman again because I'd done Crazy For You with her and Contact um, here in the West End, Crazy For You on Broadway. And um, but, but alongside that was to just be able to be a part of the world of Mel Brooks because I've been such a huge fan my whole life and I, I can recite his films you know to anyone anytime and I think that to have both of those things you know Susan Stroman and Mel Brooks as a, a dynamic that you rarely get in an opportunity to, to be a part of that was that was my original you know, I was blown away that I was going to actually be a part of that and really obviously wanted to be a part of that. Um, and yeah, you look at the people that you're up against and you, you know, sort of, we, I actually had to wait a few days to find out that I was cast and really wanted to crawl into a hole thinking about the idea that I might not be cast. And then when I was, it was just really, and I really didn't have an idea. Um, and you don't until you start rehearsal and you meet the cast and you work with the director and you meet Mel because Mel was a much bigger part of this than I ever anticipated him being. I mean, he was there with us for several weeks of rehearsal. And then once we were in the theater, he was in the second row of the stalls pretty much for every run through and every rehearsal and very open. You know, Mel is very, very open. He, he very strongly says to everybody, this is the best work he's ever done. And for Mel Brooks to say that about Mel Brooks, <laughs> I love Susan Stroman always says, um, I don't know anybody who loves being themselves more than Mel Brooks. <laughs> and I love that because he just stands up and says, I love being me because he really does and he loves this material so we got the added bonus of well, I always hoped you know that I would but we, we really did get it this time of having Susan and Mel here hands-on and that that was just beyond the wonderful cast and the wonderful material to have the original input is just invaluable especially with with transfers from Broadway to the West End you never know what you're gonna get I don't think there was ever any question that you weren't going to get this role, though, was there really? Come on. I, I don't know. I mean, I... You know I the really, answer to that. You know my, everybody was saying <laughs> Lee Zimmerman was going to get Ula. Everybody was saying. I knew that they needed a very, very large um, blonde who could, you know, sort of belt this music and handle the material. And I, But I think on another level, I was very much hoping that after working with Susan, she's very selective with um, who she knows will sort of be a nice cast and people, personalities that will get along. Little did I know that after I worked with Nathan seven years ago, and none of us knew then that, you know, it would also help me at this stage of the game work with Nathan because I, I had already experienced that. We've got the stars of the Broadway show coming up in a little later on. We'll also talk to Lee Evans. We're here for the hour at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, which is just a palace of show business. The history uh, in this building is phenomenal. One of the big stars in this is a guy who I take my hat off to because you've really nailed it. Nicholas Kalakis, thank you so much for joining us. And you've played the part of Franz Liebkin where you can't miss a word, you can't mispronounce a word, or I know Mel Brooks would be right down on you and you've got the German accent straight down, <laughs> haven't you? <laughs> well, it's something that Lee and, Lee and I both have to deal with is, is the comedy Mel Brooks accent because it isn't as much as you try and make it an authentic uh, German or Swedish accent and you, you hover on that line of totally indistinguishable to, to get the joke across and, and, uh, and make everything clear. No, it's a, it's a little feat. You've also got the greatest thrill in the show that there are a million laughs in this musical some louder than others but your opening scene I, d I can't give it away with the pigeons but something that happens at the end of your opening song is the biggest laugh certainly of the first half isn't it really I don't know I didn't know that I, I didn't so. yeah I've, of course I've never seen it so I won't give it away either <laughs> but uh, it's all happening behind me yes I think uh, children animals and uh, puppet pigeons are things not to be working with <laughs> liquids <laughs> pulling focus pulling focus <laughs> absolutely how long did it take you to get the accent down and could you explain that in your accent, in the German. In the German. It uh, didn't take very long. It's this uh, one that I have had under my sleeve for many, many years now. And I have used occasionally when I was doing the voiceovers for cartoons and things. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it's just something that you go up with. And uh, no, it did not take me very long at all. But there, there were fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, many people on the show who felt they could do the German accent better. Uh. So I constantly get little corrections 
questions left, right, and center from various people who shall remain nameless. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, well, we better not say anything about that. Who, any names? No, but my pigeons know where they live. <laughs> <laughs> and what they're going to drop on them, we won't talk about. Um, let's play your big song then. And, and very finally with you, you do know what happened to the last Fran Liebskin, don't you? The, oh, oh, yes, Brad. Oh, indeed. But um, uh, that won't be happening to me because all along Brad had been been the cover for Nathan. And uh, that is one of the things that uh, I was not going we'll to. We'll be talking to Brad Oscar in a bit, who started off in your role and went on to do the lead. You have no ambition to do that. Absolutely not. In fact, uh, I'm sure as Brad will tell you, he didn't start off in, in my role. He started off even further down, which I will leave for him to tell you. Oh, really? That's interesting because yeah. he's on the CD, isn't he? As oh, yes, 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 yes. But he, he actually started in the show as a swing. He wasn't. He wasn't. Uh, so he didn't have any character, but so through, it was really the cleaner then who ended up doing the lead role. Absolutely, through various machinations of poisoning and pushing people downstairs, he managed to make his way up the food chain. Now, what do we do now? Do we do the good and top hop clop, or do we do your other big song? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I How do we say that? Haben Sie gehört der Deutsche Bank? Oh, is that, that is not how you say hop. I'm sorry. Haben Sie gehört das Deutsche Bank? You get a little upset at that point, don't you? Because I'm not the only one that doesn't get it quite right. Nobody manages to sing that song right, except for me. There are so many gags in this show. And I think one of the interesting things about that is this is why we have repeat audiences. I mean, it, it, you cannot possibly catch it all the first time through. In fact, one of our critics here, Michael Coveney, I spoke to recently, who said he listened to the CD over and over and over again, just so that he didn't have to worry about the lyrics side of it, so that he could, you know, absorb all that because he knew that the scene, you know, the script side of it, there was going to be plenty of things flying past him too. It's on so many different levels. And one of the main things that I, I respect Mel for is that he, when he talks about the show and talks about the reason he wrote the show and the reason he attacks Hitler in the way that he does is because he, you know, Mel said, I can't compete with my enemies in their arena, you know, and the, the greatest of all enemies for, you know, Mel Brooks and for the Jewish community and for the world really was Hitler. And so instead of um, taking him down with rhetoric, he uses ridicule. And I think that that's I think that that's one of Mel's greatest successes in this show is that he's he very successfully does that. We should point out if you are very sensitive about the war, there are things in this show that will really offend you. This isn't a show for those who are sensitive about the war or indeed Hitler. You've got to come here really just with a sense of humor, an open mind and, and no pre kind of preconceptions about the show or indeed any history with the war. Because I think if you do, you could be offended. I think that was one of the things that, that they were worried about bringing the show to London because the Jewish audience in New York is very, very different, very different sense of humor, very different outlook on, on the past and on World War II than the European audience. And they were very concerned as to how the, the Jewish community in London would react. Act. Fortunately, it has gone on its head and they haven't, they, it's, I think the reactions are actually well, certainly on a level with what they were getting in New York. But we do, you know, there have been, we have had people walk out. The Sunday Telegraph reviewer found the whole thing in terribly bad taste. Well, but that's just the point. So the, the majority has actually said it is in bad taste and that's the point. You know, and if you're going to not jump on board with that, then it's, you know, then it's not the show for you. But 99.9% .9 of the audience who wants to go on a very fantastic comedic journey, then you're going to love this. You're always going to tread a fine line when you do something that is this near the knuckle for so many people. There are going to be people who, who don't, don't buy into it. But as Lee said, the majority are, are standing on their feet eight times a week. I have to ask you one serious question before we go. Nathan Lane is leaving January 8th. Everybody's booked up you can't get a ticket i don't know who you have to sleep with to get a ticket for this show <laughs> but the issue will come who do they bring in and will it still be as good when nathan leaves i think one of the fortunate things that has happened with our reviews for the show is that not only have nathan and lee and the rest of the the principals and the ensemble received fantastic reviews but the show itself has also been made the star so that i think gives us a very firm foundation for moving forward after january 8th um, but I also think that they're going to be very wise about it this time. They know they're under the microscope. They, they, you know, they went through this in New York with recasting Nathan the first time and failed and then finally got back on their feet again.
again and found the way to do it. My personal feeling is, and I, you know, I don't know basically what's happening, but if we had someone that was experienced in the role to bridge the gap between January and April, and then when Lee Evans leaves, we get two new guys to then move forward would be sort of a good bridge mm-hmm. between where we are now and where we need to be in April. But who knows? I think we'll be a lot better off than they were in New York simply because, for better or for worse, no one knows who Nathan is here. They really don't. In New York, people knew Nathan. They they knew what he was going to do. And they went to see him. So when he left, they knew what was missing. Here, if you haven't seen Nathan play it, you don't know what you're missing. So you can come and see anybody do it and think it's still a brilliant show. And I think we're going to be all the better for that. Uh, and the show will become the star rather than the names. Did you panic that week that you found out that you got a week till opening and that Richard was not going to be in it? No, I think part of... Um, um, I did a lot of interviews at that time where people were saying, oh, did the cast scramble and were you panicking and all those adjectives that yeah. sound like we were losing our minds. No, the truth is the cast was, like I said before, sitting there ready and waiting to move at this pace and there is a caliber of of um, acting and talent in this company that is very, very rare. And when you get that together, I mean, we, you know, two weeks before we even got to the stage where we were in the theater and facing what we faced with Nathan, we were ready. We were absolutely ready. And so I think there wasn't panic I think there was a sense of relief and then oh my god this is exciting we can actually go at the speed we need to go yeah. okay very funny I have to ask you one question what is your favorite line in the show god there's so many, there's so many. oh you might have to pause and and like splice us in later a moment in the show and I, I, I howled and I fell off my stool when I watched in rehearsal because I it just didn't come from anywhere which was to take the beautiful ballad if if you like the lovely ballad you have um, till him in the courtroom and then totally turn it on its head by having Nathan walk out the door and come back with his arms in the air behind a cop. I just thought that was absolutely inspired. I, uh, there are some lyrics that are my favorite because Max Bialystok is one of the you know most crass, crude, Broadway-style producers that you can ever see. And one of his first lines, and I love to hear the way that Nathan delivers this, or any actor for that matter, is my shows were always filled with class. The best champagne would fill my glass my lap was filled with gorgeous ass you couldn't call me crass in any way i love those lines and i turn up my monitor in my dressing room every night when we get to that point it's been a real pleasure meeting you both i wish you all success with this show it really doesn't need saying the papers have been so kind to this show and the papers are never nice to any show anymore lee zimmerman thank you so much congratulations on your role azula you've nailed it as of you nicholas colicus thank you so much for talking because i know you're so busy thank you thank you thank you I used to be the king, the king, the king of all Broadway.